All right. I'm going to set the following lottery using this coin. Are you even paying attention? This is for, this is, the stakes are very high here, bud. The stake, no, no. We don't care about anything else. We just care about being on TV and being ham. So the idea is heads and you're the cutest and tails and you're the most adorable. Understood? I don't think you care about this at all. All right, let's see what the gods think about this. The gods think I dropped the coin. But your tails, you are the most adorable. And I think you would agree, right? Don't even act like your heartstrings weren't tugged at by that adorable Wookiee that you just saw. Come on now. I hope you're all doing great. I mean, I'd, I mean, it's kind of strange. I'm, I'm filming this sometime before we've even met, but I hope you're doing great. I hope that you've been enjoying the class so far. This is this is past Rob speaking to future versions of you. Oh my goodness gracious, the indexicality of our language is so useful, right? Hope you're doing great. Just keep pushing. You're doing a great job already, I'm sure. So in the previous lecture, we talked about rational choice theory. We looked at three excruciating flavors of it, uh, binary preference relations, utility maximization, and choice mappings. And we kind of learned the interesting lesson that if we imposed uh, the right assumptions, the three fables told the same story, which is pretty cool when you think about it. And you're like, really, Rob? I was hoping not to think too much in this class. Sorry about that. But there's a problem with the story that we've told up to this point. There's a really important short-sightedness in the story that we've been telling. And it isn't just one of those fox and the grape sort of, oh, well, it's okay that foxes don't eat grapes because we still told a cool story. There's a very particular part of political and other phenomena that we left out of the story last time. And that's uncertainty. When you make a choice, sometimes you know for sure you're going to get what you chose and sometimes you don't. And we didn't talk about that at all. We didn't talk about uncertainty last lecture. We talked about Coke, Pepsi, Sprite, and, and, and Dr. Pepper. Look at, oh geez, look at, that's just awful. Be right back. Through the magic of television, I'm gonna fix that Sprite bottle. There, now you can sleep at night. And I can get a lucrative endorsement deal. Right, when we were buying Coke, Pepsi, Sprite, and Dr. Pepper, we knew what we were getting for sure. And it made sense to tell the story the way that we did. But we didn't think hard enough about uncertainty. So there isn't a whole lot of uncertainty with Coke purchases. However, when you applied to the University of Illinois, right, that was not a sure thing. There's an acceptance rate. Many of the people who apply here are rejected. And let's be honest, you applied to other schools too, and you may have been rejected from schools and got in here. I'm happy you're here. I hope you're happy you're here. And it isn't just applying to college. And you're like, it's applying to law school too. No, it's more than that too. When somebody starts a war, they don't know for sure what's going to happen. In fact, there's a famous quotation from the Chancellor of Germany on the eve of World War I, Theobald von Bethmann Hollweg. Nailed it on the first take! Theobald von Bethmann Hollweg. That's because I screwed it up so much last time. Uh, on the eve of battle, he said, well, if the iron dice have to be ro rolled, may God help us. Iron dice. He started a war and then he talked about dice. He was being humble. He understood that there was an aspect of uncertainty to starting a war. No matter how hard you think, no matter how hard you try, no matter how much data you collect, you just don't know. There's a lot of important things in life where you just don't get to know whether or not the thing you're choosing is gonna give you the outcome that you would hope for. I hate to break it to you, but that's just true. And you're like, yeah, that's why I didn't get an MIT. Uncertainty is at the core of a lot of political processes. So it's not great that the story that we've told up to this point doesn't tell us anything about it. So for the next two weeks, I'd like for us to talk about uncertainty and how to navigate it in a consistent, contemplative, competent way. And actually we'll be imposing some more postulates along the way. I wanna talk about how to navigate uncertainty in a consistent way. And it's not just for the political process thing. It's not just for Theobald von Bethmann Holweg. It's not just for the, the fake people that are gonna live in the fake mathematical worlds we're gonna be developing. I wanna talk about uncertainty because it's an important part of your life, okay? It's, not, it's an important part of my life. It's an important part of Chewie's life. No, it isn't. He knows exactly what he's going to get every day. He's going to get food at six and six, a walk, 
a play session, snuggles. He knows what he's going to get. But for everybody else, there's a lot of uncertainty in life. How do we navigate it capably? So today's lecture is just going to be about the mechanics of how we encode uncertainty and a useful statistic that one can calculate given some uncertainty. And then next lecture, we'll talk about really what the preferences are going to be. So today is really just sort of like a how to compute things day, how to see and how to compute. And then some of the richer punchlines will emerge next week. So I'm sorry about the fact that this is a two-parter, but I think that I'll really help you to internalize some of the lessons because you'll have a richer understanding of what the objects are when we get to next week. And then we think about what preferences over those objects look like. I'm being incredibly cryptic right now, and I should probably stop doing that. So go get yourself a cup of coffee or something and we'll get to it. In the A block, I just want to talk about what a lottery is. A lottery is going to be the, our formalization of uncertainty. Whereas once we had Coke, Pepsi, Sprite, Dr. Pepper, now we're going to have a bunch of probabilities over some set of outcomes. So when you buy a lottery ticket, you know what the potential outcomes are and you know what the probabilities over those respective outcomes are, or it's on the back of the lottery ticket. Most people don't turn to the back before they do any scratching, but we'll talk about that when we get there. This idea of probability over outcomes, be they monetary or non-monetary, is going to be fundamental for our class. Sometimes we'll be taking probability as exogenous, as in today, where we're like, oh, okay, well, you bought a lottery ticket and the state determined what the probabilities over the outcomes would be. You knew those going into the interaction. They were given to you. And sometimes the probabilities that are going to emerge are going to be endogenous in the sense that people are going to be choosing them strategically. I will strategically set probabilities over some of my actions just to keep you guessing. So probability isn't all around us, but it's a really useful way for us to think about uncertainty. And so the A block is going to be our way of making sure that we're all on the same page about that. In the B block, I'll show you what a statistician would probably do if you handed them a scratch ticket by showing you how to compute the expected value of a random variable. Now, a random variable in the case of a lottery ticket is going to be something monetary. And in the B block, we'll keep things exactly there. I'll show you just the raw rudiments of how to compute expected value. You'll see formulas. You'll see examples. It should be relatively straightforward. We'll see about that. Then in the C block, some magic is going to happen because we're going to extend the intuition that you just had a good sense of from the B block. Anybody can compute an expected value if you show them how to. It might take some practice, but you can do it. We're going to take that teachable, easy enough to do algorithm and apply it to utility functions and in the form of expected utility calculations. So we're going to take what was expected value of something monetary and generalize the logic to something a little bit broader like expected utility. In particular, I want to show you two very important expected utilities that have emerged in the political science literature over the years. Things that I would hope that you could internalize and tell to somebody else if you needed to, if somebody said, hey, tell me a fable, would you? So we're going to be covering a lot over the next two weeks, but I hope that we can do so at a somewhat leisurely play pace. I don't want you to be feeling sad or stupid because you're not sad. You're not, well, you might be sad, but you're not stupid. This is hard. You're learning a language and substance and math all at the same time. You're doing an amazing job. So please give yourself some credit for that. Cut yourself some slack, would you? I think that you'll start to see that you're, you're going faster than you realize. You'll see that once we get to the A block of today's lecture. So let's get started. So here in the A block, I just want to introduce the notion of a lottery. And you're like, I know what lotteries are. It's what my grandparents play. Mine too. But actually, we need a more abstract notion of what a lottery is. I know it's hard to believe, but I'm going to try to turn this a bit abstract. So we need an abstract notion about what a lottery is. And before we get to the, the mathematics of it, before we get to the definition of it, I just want to introduce the idea of a, of a probability over two outcomes, okay? So, so consider this beautiful coin. So this is my, this is my silver walking Liberty. This is a beautiful little coin. Not little, it's actually pretty heavy. Um, you know, so in order to buy some of this stupid movie equipment, I, I had to go and sell some of my coins, but I, I just couldn't bring myself to sell this last um, walking Liberty. So suppose that I was, I, I said to you, I've got a game that you can choose to play if you want to. All right. So we're, we'll set up a game that goes like this. Uh, so I'm going to toss the coin. And it's a fair coin. This is this this coin. It comes up heads as often as it comes up tails. We'll talk about how to encode that in a second. So I'll say if it comes up heads, 
then you win $1, okay? And if it comes up tails, you lose $2. And the subject of today's lecture, at least the first two blocks is, can you assign a number that tells you how you feel about that that's reasonable? And it's actually trickier than it seems, you'll see. When I say that there's an equal chance that it will come up heads and it will come up tails, what that means is, if I wanted to, to formalize that, if I wanted to come up for an, with an encoding for that, I would say that there are two outcomes on this coin, right? There's, there's the beautiful heads. I gotta cover my own ugly head for that. And there's the beautiful tails. Let's let the autofocus come back. Come on, autofocus, you can do it. You can do it. So there are two outcomes, heads and tails, which right now are associated with monetary outcomes of winning a dollar for heads and losing $2 for tails, okay? So we have these two outcomes, heads and tails, which you might as well say are $1 and minus $2. So right now I've got a list of outcomes. So, so the first part of a lottery is gonna be a, a list of outcomes. You can call this X if you wanted to. Here, it's not gonna be alternatives that you're choosing between, but rather outcomes that the gods are choosing over for you. So, so that's the basic idea, is we begin with this list of possible outcomes that are known in advance. The decision maker in the theory we'll be developing over the next two weeks and the rest of the class, the decision maker knows what the possible outcomes are. That might be unreasonable. I would say that that's part of them being contemplative, right? So they've thought through what the potential outcomes are. I told you when I specified this Carnival Barker game, I specified what the outcomes would be. You know what those outcomes are a priori. But there's a second part, and that's the uncertainty part, right? We need for every one of these outcomes, $1 minus $2, for both of them, we need to assign that a probability. We need to assign a probability to that. A probability is just gonna be a mathematical way of saying chance, where higher probabilities mean something is a more likely outcome, and lower probabilities mean that something is a less likely outcome. I know this seems like I'm splitting hairs, but you'd be surprised just how wrinkled things can get down there. So, so in this particular example, I said it was a fair coin, right? I said it comes up heads as often as it comes up tails. Now, when we scale probabilities, they're a number that's non-negative. So a probability has to be greater than or equal to zero. And then the probabilities over all the outcomes have to add up to one, which means the probabilities are numbers that fall between zero and one where zero means like perfectly unlikely, one means perfectly likely. Fair coin, the thing that makes them even would be 50% heads, 50% tails, which is probability 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So throughout these two lectures, whenever I wanna talk about a lottery, I'll specify a set of outcomes X, and then I'll come up with a vector, an ordered list of probabilities, one for every one of those outcomes, where each of those numbers is non-negative and they have to add up to one. So that's what a lottery is. A lottery, for the purposes of our class and in most models of uncertainty, a lottery is a set of outcomes, X, and a set of probabilities over those outcomes. All right, and that's it. There are all sorts of fair lotteries that you can think of, right? So when I say fair, I mean like there's an equal chance of everything happening. So in the case of a coin, where there are two outcomes, heads and tails, in the, in the case of a coin, the, the fair probabilities, the even probabilities, the uniform probabilities are one half, one half. With a die, I should show you that it's a die, right? The, the probabilities change because there are six possible outcomes now, one, two, three, four, five, six, which you could tag to any monetary outcomes if you wanted to. We call that craps or, or something like that. It would be one sixth, one sixth, one sixth, one sixth, one sixth, one sixth. That would be a vector of probabilities. So for any list of outcomes, you can already think about what the, the uniform distribution would look like, but that doesn't have to be the only distribution. For example, suppose again that you were Theobald von Bethmann Holweg on the eve of World War I, right? So you could win or you could lose. Let's just keep things super duper simple. You could win the war, or you could lose the war. There's no guarantee that that's a 50-50 proposition, right? We need to think about a way that we could pin that down. It could be that you've got, you've got a 25% chance of winning and a 75% chance of losing, in which case the probabilities would be 0 0.25, 0 0.75. It could be that you've got a two-thirds chance of winning and a one-thirds chance of losing, in which case the probabilities would be two-thirds, one-third. It could be that you are perfectly certain that you are going to win. 
in which case the probabilities would be one and zero. That's not uncertain anymore, but notice that we can think about it within the same apparatus. Last week's lecture is actually a special case of this week's lecture because for any sure thing, there they come again. So for any sure thing, I can write that down as a lottery, even if that seems a bit pedantic, just so that I can have that in, in vector form. So one zero means I know I'm gonna win. Zero one means I know I'm gonna lose, right? You can have that. So a probability in, in, a, in a binary outcome, if there are two possible outcomes, the probability can be any vector such that the first number falls between zero and one, and the second number is one minus that. One nice way to, to visualize what's going on in a lottery is with something called an uncertainty tree. And what you do with an uncertainty tree is you sort of draw all of the possible outcomes of the lottery. So in the, let's just keep things like warlike for, for now. Let's say you could win, you could lose, or you could draw. So it's a ternary outcome this time. Win, lose, stalemate. That's how a lot of the data for wars are coded. And the idea is I'm just going to come up with a tree that shows me like a node. That's the, that's the beginning of the uncertainty. And it's sort of, there's a line that goes to every one of those possible outcomes. This isn't that hard. I'll just attach a probability to every one of these lines. Okay. And just to make sure that you've pinned down the idea of abstraction, apparently this is the abstraction symbol. Let's say that you could win with probability P sub win. You could draw with probability P sub draw. And you could lose with P sub lose, which happens to be equal to one minus P sub win minus P sub lose. So I've got a vector of probabilities and I could have said win, lose, draw, but it's nice to be able to visualize things like this sometimes. This'll, this'll be important when we get to extensive form games too, where some things will be certain and some things will be uncertain. The reason I like to talk about uncertainty trees is they're a nice way for me to tell you about something called a compound lottery. A compound lottery is something like a two-step or multiple-step lottery, and you'll see actually that it, it is exactly a lottery as, as well. So let's use the tree apparatus to talk about a compound lottery. Suppose that I, I said, I will roll a die, okay? And when I roll the die, if one, two, three, or four comes up, then we'll call that one outcome. And if five or six comes up, we'll call that another outcome. So, th so the beginning lottery, is like one, two, three, four, or five or six. Now, that means that the probability of going up the top node is two thirds, right? So, so two thirds of those outcomes uh, are one, two, three, or four. And one third of the outcomes, five or six, go to the bottom, all right? So that's the beginning of the lottery. That's step one of this lottery is one, two, three, four, or five or six. And let's say regardless of what happens, I will then toss a coin. And if you got one, two, three, or four, and if it comes up heads after I toss the coin, then you lose a dollar. And if it comes up tails, then you get zero dollars. And we'll say that if you get a five or a six, and then it comes up heads, you get zero dollars. So heads are bad. And if it comes up tails, then you win $10. Okay. So this is a lottery. It's just a two-step lottery where the probability of being on the top branch is two thirds. And then you've got a 50, 50 proposition after that. And the probability of going to the bottom branch is one thirds. And then you've got another 50, 50 proposition after that. Now, what's the probability of arriving at each of these nodes? Pause the video and tell me the probability of arriving at each of these endings, right? There's lose a dollar, zero, zero, or win $10. Okay. What, what are the, what are the probabilities? How do you know the probability of every one of these outcomes? Pause the video. Pause the video. Welcome back to the three of you that went to the bathroom. So here's what you do, right? Notice what you do is you, you multiply, you multiply the probabilities along the way. These were independent events. I rolled a die and then I tossed a coin. These, they didn't influence one another. So, you had a two thirds chance of riding up the top branch and then a 50% chance after that of going to minus $1, which means that the probability of minus $1 is two thirds times one half, which is one third. The probability of getting $0 the top way, the one where you're like, oh my God, I'm so glad that I, that I only, that I got out of this unscathed is two thirds times one half, that's a third. 
The probability of getting zero dollars the disappointing way, where you're like, oh, I've got a chance for $10 and then it comes up zero. Well, that's one third times one half, that's one sixth. And the probability of winning $10 in this lottery is also one sixth, one third times one half. So basically you can lose a dollar with probability one third. You could get zero dollars with probability one half and you could win $10 with probability one sixth. Those add up to one if you didn't notice and they're all non-negative numbers. So I could just as easily have had a three-way lottery at the beginning that covered these three outcomes and assigned them those probabilities. A compound lottery is a simple lottery. And you're like, what does it have anything to do with lotteries? Well, we're gonna get to that in the B block a little bit, but just to give you a preview, here's a lottery, this is a lottery. Look, it even says lottery on it. You see that, that's a lottery. This is a lottery, I'm holding a lottery. I'm holding a lottery in my hand right now. This is a lottery. It says lottery on it. Now, I'm gonna do the thing that the people in Springfield don't want you to do. I'm gonna take this lottery ticket and I'm gonna turn it over and learn about it. Cause on the front, it says you could win $10,000. And you're like, I have to pay $1 to get $10,000. This is the investment chance of a lifetime. But then you turn it over and you think about it. And there's actually a bunch of outcomes that are possible in this game. There's a bunch of possible outcomes in this game. And they have to tell you that. It's either on the back of the ticket or on some incredibly confusing website that they don't want you to read. So the possible outcomes in this lottery are you could lose, right? You could lose. And if you lose, then you, then you get zero dollars. You get zero dollars. That's the thing they don't want to tell you about. You could lose this lottery. You could lose. You could get zero dollars for this lottery ticket. You could pay a dollar and wind up with zero dollars. Suddenly it's not such a great sounding investment, right? But there are other possible outcomes. Like you could win your money back. You could win one dollar. You could win one dollar with this lottery. You could win two dollars. You could double your money. You could win five dollars with this lottery. You could win $10 with this lottery. You could win 25, you could win 50. Suddenly this is sounding pretty good again, right? You could win 50 bucks. This lottery ticket, you don't know what it's worth because we haven't scratched it, but it could be worth, this lottery ticket could be worth 50 bucks. It could also be worth a hundred bucks. A hundred dollars is possible with this lottery. So too is five, you could win $500 with this lottery. This lottery ticket could be worth $500. You could go to Chipotle for a month. This lottery ticket could be worth $1,000. A lottery ticket worth $1,000. That changes your life this semester probably, right? You could win $10,000 with this lottery. That would pay off your tuition for the year. Semester, let's be honest. That, that's amazing, right? That could be, you could win $10,000. It says right on the front, you could win $10,000. So the, the problem is there's probabilities associated with all those outcomes. I'll, I'll start with the ones where you don't lose because that's what, that's what they tell you about. The problem, the, I, I worked this all this out on my computer, so, so forgive me if I'm like looking this way. So the probability of getting $1 in this lottery is 0 0.0925. So you have a 9% chance of winning your money back with probability 0 0.0725. So a seven and a quarter percent chance, you could double your money. These are all gonna go down as we go. With, with, a, with probability 0 0.0225, so a two and a quarter percent chance, you could win $5. Probability of winning $10 is 0 0.0125, so one and a quarter percent chance. The probability of winning $25, it's, I mean, it's nice, but it's, it's a modest sum, is 0 0.00407, so a 0.4% chance of winning $25. Your chances of winning $50 with this lottery are 0 0.000565, so a five and a half, per, oh, sorry, a 0.5% chance, a 0.6% chance of winning 50 bucks. 100 bucks, 0. 0.000117. I mean, that's not a very likely outcome suddenly, right? $500, the probability is 0. 0.00000634. Minuscule chances, minuscule. The probability of winning $1,000 is 0. 0.00000. 167. And the probability of winning the promised $10,000, the probability of winning the big prize in this particular lottery is 0.00000834. So you basically have no chance. I mean, it's not that you have no chance. You know, they probably print a couple million of these and there's a couple of them that give you $10,000. 
but your chances of winning with this are not very high. If you buy this lottery ticket, it probably ought to be because you think it's fun. We'll talk about that next week. And the thing that they don't tell you is the probability of, of losing, the probability that you wind up giving them a dollar for nothing. And that's one minus the sum of all those things, right? That's one minus the sum of all those things. And that's, you're going to lose about 80% of the time. Your probability of winning something, including just your money back, is 0.205, which means that your probability of losing is 0.795. So you have about an 80% chance of losing this lottery and about a 20% chance of winning. And the chances of winning something really good, very, very low. So that's what a lottery is. It's a vector of outcomes, well-specified outcomes. X is a, is, a, is a set of outcomes, and then a vector of probabilities over those outcomes, where it could be something numeric, like you know, in the form of what's on the back of a lottery ticket, or it could be something abstract, like you have a P percent chance of winning a war. So you're gonna get used to this, whether you like it or not. And I hope that you'll come to like it because it's a really nice way to think about uncertainty, which is all around us. So in the B block, we'll talk about what a statistician would tell you to do with something like this in the form of expected value calculations. Looking forward to that. See you there. So here in the B block, I want to get to the bottom of this 10 grand. I want to understand what kind of what kind of things can I do to learn more about this? What can I do to summarize all that information I just gave you at the end of the A block? So this, this ticket is confusing, and that's by design, right? The thing with people that are trying to take money off of you through gambling things is they don't want you to have a completely good picture of what's going on. You go to a casino, and they give you free drinks. Free drinks. They give you free drinks. And the reason they give you free drinks is you'll make worse decisions as you get drunker. You know, I like to play blackjack. They always have these, the, all these weird side bets that you don't understand what the heck is happening. The only thing you know for sure is that the weirder the side bet is, the worse your chances are. And what they're gunning for is something that looks very spectacular. They want something like 10 grand. They want the side game to have something that really catches your attention with that top end, but where you have no hope about thinking through adequately what the probability of that is. You know, they're, all, they're not nice enough at the casino to give you the probabilities the same way that they do on the back of lottery tickets. But let's suppose that we have a well-specified lottery. Let's say we have a well-specified lottery. And remember, a lottery is just a list of outcomes, in this case, monetary outcomes, zero, one, two, five, 10, et cetera, and a set of probabilities over those outcomes. So every one of these numbers is something you could understand. But the question is like, what's going on with all the relationships between the numbers, right? So, so this lottery is more than every individual data point inside it. No one row is enough for you to want to make your choice. You need to know how these things all go together, right? So the question is, how do we come up with something that reads in one of these and spits out a single number that makes some sense to you? I need a function that reads in lottery tickets and spits out the amount of money that I can expect to get from that lottery ticket. I need an expected value machine. I need a breaststroke. I need a function that lives in the middle that reads in this complicated Excel spreadsheet and spits out one number that I can interpret. That's what I want. That's my goal here. Now, there's all sorts of numbers that you could assign to a given lottery ticket to, to, to try to understand it. But there's one number that is very special. There's one function that is very special in terms of how it reads in lotteries and how it spits out these numbers. We're gonna be calculating a, a statistic. What a statistic is, is a function that reads in something uncertain and spits out something certain. Spits out a number that you can understand. That's what a statistic is. And I wanna calculate a very special statistic called the expected value. You've probably calculated expected value. You, you may have done it during the A block if you were bored, right? You've calculated expected values before. And it's just a weighted average. It's a probabilistically weighted average. You take these probabilities and you use them to figure out what the average is gonna be. If you can do this, then you can calculate your grade in the class, which as we'll learn the week before finals week is something that you can't do. It's gonna be like, dear Professor Carroll, what is my grade? Love everybody. 
We need a function. We need a function that reads in lotteries and spit, spits out numbers you can understand. So here's how we're going to do it. I'm going to take this lottery, all right, which right now is two columns in an Excel spreadsheet. What's the outcome and what's the probability of that outcome? Right, so that's column A and column B in an Excel spreadsheet. You can go get yourself a spreadsheet open if you want to, right? So you can write these all out if you want to, right? Add these, add all these to your, to your Excel spreadsheet. Well, that, suddenly I'm a dynamic teacher. Now add a third column. And what we want is to multiply the first two columns together piecewise, right? So, so I want to take that zero, that zero outcome and multiply it by the 0.795 chance of losing. And it turns out that zero times 0.795 is, you got it, zero. So that's an easy one. There was a 0.0925 probability assigned to the, the outcome of $1, which means that it's one times 0.0925, which is 0.0925. The probability of getting $2 was 0.0725. So it's just two times 0.0725 which is 0.145. I should have been able to do that in my head, and yet. So we're just gonna do that for every one of these rows in our Excel spreadsheet. We just make a third column that's the first column times the second column. Now notice that that third column is measured in dollars. Right, that third column is a dollar amount multiplied by a probability, which is unitless. You wind up with dollars which means I could add up all of these numbers and wind up with an, a dollar amount. And it turns out that what I would wind up if I did that is the expected dollar amount, the expected value of this lottery. The expected value of this lottery is a number in dollars and cents that is the single best guess about what you're gonna get. It's the, num it's the thing that if you had a stack of these and just kept scratching them, and then every time calculated the mistake about what your guess is and, and this, if you want to minimize the error that you made across a whole stack of these, you would choose the expected value number. That's the number that you would reasonably expect to get out of this lottery ticket. So for example, if the expected value of this is more than a dollar, then that sounds like, that sounds pretty good, right? And if it's less than a dollar, that sounds pretty bad. It means that the dollar that you had for sure, probability one times one dollar, that was a, that was a, this is a lottery too. And not just in the, in the coin flip sense, this is a lottery in the sense that it's $1 for sure. This is $1 for sure, right? The expected value of this is $1 and the expected value of this is 0 0.63, 63 cents. So if you give up this to get this, then in expectation, you just lost 37 cents. The 37 cents is the revenue that the state is hoping to get so that they can pay for all the things that they want to pay for. Some of the things, sometimes the lottery tickets are for a particular cause and sometimes they're not. This one isn't. That's 37 cents. That's the premium. That's, 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 what, they're, that's what they're expecting to get off of you for every dollar that you spend on lottery tickets. The state expects to make $37 in revenue off of you. You go to the casino, your expected value of, of any given gambling game is lower, no matter how good you are, is lower than, than what the money that you put in. The casino is making money off of you in expectation. You might win, you might come home from Vegas and tell stories about how much money you won. You might say, look at this, I, Vegas is easy, I do a great job. And then you go back a few times and suddenly you realize that you were an idiot. If you go to Vegas, go to have fun. Not too much fun. If you play a lottery ticket, do it for fun. This is not a way for you to pay your college tuition. You're gonna lose 37 cents on the dollar. We can use expected values in more abstract settings. Okay, so, so suppose that I had just a three-way lottery that was win, lose, or draw, and let's say that winning is $5, uh, draw is $0, and losing is minus $10. But let's say that I don't know the probabilities as numbers. Suppose I wanna leave them as variables. Let's say the probability of winning is P win, We'll say the probability of drawing is P draw, and we'll say the probability of losing is one minus P win minus P draw. Now, those aren't numbers. There's, you can multiply them, but you're not gonna, if you, if you ask Microsoft Excel to do the, the adding for you, they'll look at you like you're an idiot. Well, then what's the expected value of this lottery if Microsoft Excel won't get it for us? Well, we can just write this out as a formula that will still be variable depending on the probabilities in question. So it'll be 
five bucks for winning times P win, plus zero bucks for drawing times P draw, that's a zero, minus $10 times one minus P win minus P draw. And you could just simplify that. Next thing you know, you've got something in terms of P wins and P draws that lets you know if this is a good bet or a bad bet. We're gonna be doing that pretty often in the class. We're gonna be coming up with abstract formulas for what an expected utility is. And all the time, it's gonna be some probability, P win, P lose, P draw, some P, multiplied by a number or some other variable, and then add it up. So, so the expected value of this particular lottery ticket is in dollars and cents, because we know the outcomes and we know the probabilities at a numeric level. These are not variables. But throughout the class, we'll be taking a more flexible approach where the probabilities and or the outcomes could be variables, letters, all right? So just be prepared for that. But if you need to come back to the B block of this lecture to remember that it's not that hard, that all we're trying to do is take tables of probabilities and outcomes and turn them into numbers that we can understand, then you're gonna be just fine. I'm not trying to spook you, you know? I'm trying, I, I want you to feel me more reassured than spooked. And you're like, you're doing a great job of it. I know. There were other statistics that we could calculate from a given lottery. There's all sorts of different statistics. And if you're interested in how to understand something that goes on underneath something probabilistic, then this isn't the class for you. You should take a probability statistics class in the math or stats department if you want to, or you should take a political methodology class in the political science department, where we're oftentimes thinking about how to use probability and statistics to uncover interesting things in political data sets. But you don't have to be a probabilist, and that's how you pronounce it. You don't have to be a probabilist to know how to calculate an expected value on a lottery ticket. All right? You just have to be able to make it a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet if you need to. And I, I'm, I'm pretty confident you can do that. And you can imagine any lottery. It could be a binary lottery. It could be a ternary lottery. It could be a lottery with the Google outcomes, where every one of those Google outcomes is assigned a probability. And you could repeat this procedure. This procedure works for very complicated lotteries. They could be simple lotteries. They could be compound lotteries. They could be monetary lotteries. They could be abstract lotteries. They could be all sorts of different lotteries. But every time there's this simple machine of the expected value function. So if you can take an average, if you can take an average, you're set up for success so far. The question is, how are we going to take this thing that you understand in terms of money and turn it into something flexible enough to talk about non-monetary outcomes? We'll talk about expected utility rather than expected value over in the C block. See you there. So here in the C block, I want to talk about expected utility. Now, what do I mean by expected utility? You may have heard about expected utility before. We were just talking about expected values over in the B block. What's expected utility? How is it related to expected value, if at all? And does it have a similar intuition? And the answer is yes, it has a similar intuition. So the concept of expected utility is the following. Suppose that I've got a lottery. Right? So I've got a lottery, which means I've got a, a set of outcomes, and let's make them non-numeric this time. Let's just say it's Coke, Pepsi, Dr. Pepper, and Sprite. I only have six-sided dye in my house. So I don't have an exotic dye. I know it's hard to believe from what you've seen so far, but I'm not a nerd. And suppose that what I did was I said that if it comes up, if, if you get a one, you get a Coke. If you get a two, you get a Pepsi. If you get a three, you get a Sprite. And if you get a four, you get a Dr. Pepper. And if you get a five or a six, you get nothing. So we'll say that there are five outcomes, five outcomes, th those, those four pops and nothing. And you have a one-sixth chance of Coke, a one-sixth chance of Pepsi, a one-sixth chance of Sprite, and a one-sixth chance of Dr. Pepper, along with a one-third chance of nothing. Now I ask you, what's your expected value for this lottery? And you're like, well, it's one-sixth times Coke. And a sixth times Pepsi. Does that sound like a well-formed enterprise to you? No, we need something that reads in Coke, Pepsi, Sprite, Dr. Pepper and spits out numbers, a utility function. We need a utility function. So I need a third column in my data set. And I need that column to be the utility of any given outcome, all right? So let's say that my, my utility for not getting a bottle of pop is zero. Let's say I get zero happiness points. The, the fancy term is sometimes utils, but happiness points. You get zero happiness points if you, if you don't get 
any pop. We'll say that Coke gives you a four, Pepsi gives you a three, Sprite gives you a two, and Dr. Pepper gives you a one. So now I've got a new row, and it might as well be the dollars. It might as well be the dollars. This is what expected utility is, is expected value on utilities rather than expected value on the actual outcomes themselves. There's this intermediate step. There's this intermediate step of getting the utilities. And that's oftentimes a substantive part of our modeling enterprise. So now, instead of having three columns, I'm gonna have a fourth column, and that's gonna be where I do my multiplying. And I'm gonna multiply every probability by every utility. So I'll multiply my probability of Coke, which is one sixth, times the four that I get for Coke. I wind up with two thirds. I'll multiply the probability of getting a Pepsi, which is one sixth, times my utility for Pepsi, which is three, and wind up with one half. I'll multiply my probability of getting Sprite, which is one sixth, times my utility from Sprite, which is two, and I'll wind up with one third. And I'll take my probability of getting Dr. Pepper, which is one sixth, and multiply it by my utility from Dr. Pepper, which is one, and get one sixth. So my expected utility for this lottery of dice and pop is two thirds plus one half plus one third plus one sixth plus zero. Remember that up until this point, these utility numbers don't represent any sort of scale. All they do is convey ranking information. When I say four, three, two, one, what I mean is Coke is strictly better than Pepsi, which in turn is strictly better than Sprite, which in turn is strictly better than Dr. Pepper, which in turn is strictly better than getting nothing. All I've conveyed to you with these utilities is ranking information, but we'll eventually, in, in next lecture, we'll be talking about these as a meaningful scale. However, one and two thirds as a number doesn't really mean anything. We'll be choosing things with the highest expected utility, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we get anything useful. It wasn't like 63 cents, like what you got in the, it, with, with a lottery ticket, okay? That's one and two thirds. This is just for our introductory example. Now, let me show you two important expected utilities from political science. I'm gonna start with the easier of the two, which goes back to Theobald von bethmann holweg this is the usual expected utility of war in the bargaining model of war. So the idea here is that when you start a war, which please don't do, but if you were starting a war and you called me to be your advisor, I'm the Henry Kissinger in this situation. You, you didn't do so well. So you call me to be your advisor and you're thinking about starting a war. And I'm like, okay, so what could happen when you start this war? And you're like, well, if, if I start this war, I could win or I could lose. And I'm like, oh, thanks for having an Excel spreadsheet ready for me already. I was planning on having to spend the first week doing that and still charging you consulting fees for it. There, you're like, I could win or I could lose. And I would say to you, well, what are your utilities for that? What are your utilities for that? And if we, if we think about it, let's say that your utility for winning is one happiness point and your utility for losing is zero happiness points, okay? Now, here's the problem. When you start a war, you don't just win or lose. You pay a cost. You have to pay a cost for the right to play that lottery. You have to pay a dollar for the right to play this lottery. And for the right to start a war, you have to kill people. You have to salt fields. You have to raise cities. You have to do awful things. What you wind up winning when you start a war is far less than what was there to begin with because you messed up a bunch of stuff along the way. You totally up the world just so that you could get a happiness point. So actually, I would say to you, your utility for winning is not just the one that you think you get, it is one minus C, where C is some cost. It might be 0.8, in which case you don't win very much. It might be 0.01, in which case you, you, you win quite a bit. So what C does is it tells us about the cost of war. In utils, we take all those costs now, a utility function is implicitly something that reads in carnage and spits out a cost in utils that lets us know just how much worse than winning is winning. A clean win versus a messy win. And there's no clean wins. Similarly, if you lose, you still got to pay a cost, right? So we'll say that your utility, if you lose the war, is zero minus C, which is just minus C. So we get together. I'm sitting in the Oval Office with you, or whatever your respective head of state office is, and I'm like, okay, so the utility for winning is one minus C, and the utility for losing is minus C. And then I say to you, okay, well, what's the probability that you're gonna win the war? 
How strong are you feeling? Do you have a really good army compared to your enemy? Do you have like a totally badass army? Do you have a not so badass army? Is it about even? Is it like, how are we doing here? And you're like, I have no idea. I'm like, what kind of leader are you? You're like, I'm actually the hero from the Woody Allen movie, Bananas. Highly recommended to go watch that movie, by the way. You're like, I have no idea what I'm doing. So I say to you, all right, we should probably just proceed as if you knew anything. So let's say that your probability of winning is P. P could be 0.1 if it's the Vatican City fighting the United States. Actually, 0.1 is way too generous. It's just a bunch of Swiss men with sticks. But uh, we'll say that, you know, if, if you don't have a very high chance of winning, it's like 0.1. If you have a completely badass army, then it's like 0.9. If it's an even balance, it's like 0.5. It's like a fair toss of a coin. Theobald von Bethmann Holweg was referring to this column in an Excel spreadsheet when he was talking about the iron dice. He didn't know if he was going to win or lose. He had some probability in his mind P that he would win and some probability in his mind 1 minus P that he would lose, even if he didn't actually do the calculations. Uncertainty is around us. Probability is how we encode it. So now I've got I could win and get 1 minus C with probability P or I could lose and get minus C with probability 1 minus P. And the next step is we, we, take, the, we take the utility and we multiply it by the probability. So 1 minus C times P is P minus PC. And one minus P times minus C is minus C times one minus P. We'll just keep that in, in, in simple form there. Chicka, 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 chicka. You wind up with P minus C. P minus C, your expected utility is P minus C, where you can compare that to zero for losing, one for winning, P minus C, okay? Now think, if P is really high, if you have a very good chance of winning, then your expected utility of war is pretty high. If P is low, if you have a bad chance of winning, then your expected utility of war is pretty low. That's called a comparative statics result where we take how one variable influences the outcome variable, right? So, so more chances of winning, better expected utility. Lower chances of winning, lower expected utility. M bigger army, smaller army, okay? Same with costs of war, right? So if, if the war is gonna be really messy, if it's one of those wars where people just have to die en masse, if it's one of these ugly trench protracted wars, I hope it isn't, but if it is one, then the costs of war are very large and P minus C is tiny. It's a bad, that's not so good. And if the cost of war is small, if it's like drones versus drones and this is all just in the abstract, right? So the cost of war is just how much your drone cost you, then, then the, the expected utility of war is relatively higher. So what I'm saying to you when I work out all of this stuff is that the, the standard vanilla expected utility of war depends on two variables. Your probability of winning, which has a positive relationship with your expected utility of war, and the cost of war, which has a negative relationship with your expected utility. So that's, that's the whole idea here, okay? P minus C. That's gonna be one you get used to. We're gonna do the expected utility of war a few times. There's actually an entire theory of war called the expected utility of war, the, the expected utility theory of war, right? That's, that plays a really important role in international relations theory. Now, I happen to find all this interesting because I'm most interested in international relations, but let me show you a, another very famous expected utility, the expected utility of voting. Let me preface this because this always gets misinterpreted. I don't care if you vote. You want to vote, vote. You want to not vote, don't vote. I don't care. And I'm not telling you that voting is rational or irrational. You do whatever you want, okay? I'm not telling you one way or another. I'm just trying to show you a cool way to think about something that might be the beginning of an analysis in your head. It probably shouldn't be the end point of your analysis, but it's a good place to get started when you're thinking through what voting looks like for yourself or for others. So here's the idea. When you decide to go vote or not vote, there are a couple different variables that matter. One variable that matters is how much you like your preferred candidate versus your not so preferred candidate. And we'll say that that's B happiness points. You get B happiness points if your preferred candidate wins. We'll say that you have to pay a cost of voting C that represents the time that you spend and the shoe leather that you burn, the gas that you have to, to burn or the, the, the cost of your bus ticket. There's a cost of voting C. And B and C are gonna be primary determinants of your expected utility of voting. So we'll say that you know, everybody else has decided to vote and you're thinking about whether to go vote. 
there are four relevant outcomes to think about. It could be that your preferred candidate was already winning, whether you voted or not. It could be that your preferred candidate was in an exact tie over your less preferred candidate. It could be that your preferred candidate was exactly one vote behind relative to the less preferred candidate. And it could be that your preferred candidate was two or more votes behind. All right. Let's say that those occur with probability P win, P tie, P small loss, and P large loss, which is one minus P win minus P tie minus P small loss. Okay. And just for the purposes of today's lecture, let's say that if there's a tie, then you get B over two happiness points. We'll say that like they toss a coin. They toss a coin to see who wins if there's a tie. So if there's a pure win, you get B happiness points. And if there's a tie, you get B over two happiness points. Let's think through what happens if you don't vote and what happens if you vote. Okay. So if you don't vote, if you don't vote, you don't pay any cost of voting because you stayed home playing Assassin's Creed. So if you don't vote and we're in the world where your preferred candidate is winning, you get B happiness points for free. If we're in the world where there, there's a tie, you get B over two happiness points for free. If we're living in the world where your preferred candidate was down by one vote, you get zero happiness points for free. And if we're living in the world where your preferred candidate was losing by two or more votes, you get zero happiness points also for free. So it's B, B over two, zero, and zero. Now let's say you voted. Well, if you, if you voted and your candidate was already winning, then you get B happiness points because they won and you have to pay a cost. So it's B minus C, B minus C happiness points here. Now in world two, this is, you were decisive. You, you, took, you took your preferred candidate from a tie to a win. So you get B happiness points minus C. So instead of, instead of having to put up with B over two, you get B minus C because your preferred candidate won, but you had to forego playing Assassin's Creed. Another chance for you to be decisive is in world three. Well, in world three, your preferred candidate was going to lose, but you took them up to a tie. So now you get B over two minus C. So instead of getting zero, you get B over two minus C. And in world four, you still get zero, but you have to pay the cost minus C. And my question to you, and you can pause the video and calculate if you want to, practice at home, it's okay. When is the not voting, when is that expected utility higher than the voting expected utility? What's the relationship between these two expected utilities? And the answer is, it depends on the probabilities, right? So if you work out the if you work out the expected utility of voting minus the expected utility of not voting, if you just calculate the two expected utilities and then subtract one from the other, you'll see that the relative expected utility of voting is p tie plus p small win uh, small loss over two times b minus c. So basically, what that is is the probability that you are decisive the probability that you go from a tie to a win or from a small loss to a tie, that's the average of those two probabilities times the benefit of your preferred candidate minus the cost for sure. You pay the cost no matter what. So that's sometimes you hear PB minus C and this is just a slightly richer version of that. So here's the question. What's, the, what's P tie plus P small loss over two? In a large election with hundreds of millions of voters, what's the probability that if you didn't vote, there's exactly a tie or that your preferred candidate was losing by exactly one vote and calls you and says, oh my God, please come save me. Pretty tiny. That's a number that's really, 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 really close to zero. And you have a better chance of winning $10,000 with this thing. It's a tiny probability. So something really close to zero times B minus C is probably negative. You'd have done better by staying home. You'd have done better by staying home. Now, this, that isn't true. You should do whatever you want. I'm not telling you not to vote. I'm just saying that this is the starting point for a lot of things. Expected utilities like this, when specified in a theoretical way, are oftentimes something like a Mr. Potato Head doll or a Mrs. Potato Head doll, where it isn't just the the doll itself and how beautiful the doll is but also like how many different things can you attach to it is it versatile is it a useful doll to kind of play all sorts of different games with extended metaphor that went wrong again and the expected utility of voting the calculus of voting as first specified by downs 54 and then expounded a little bit upon by Riker and Ordershik 68 
it's not that it's true. It's a fable. But it's a fable that gets you thinking, right? It's a fable that'll help you to crush dinner parties for sure. It's something to get you thinking about how do we as citizens in a democracy participate amid uncertainty? And the answer is it's it's pretty simple if you if you give yourself some time to think it through, but you might have a weird stark outcome at the end that might require you to think a little bit harder about how to amend your model so that something that looks irrational, which I haven't said anything about that, but something that appears like a, a wonky choice, hundreds of millions of people make that wonky choice. An interesting question is why? There's a whole literature on that. That literature has been developing since this expected utility irritated so many people. PB minus C irritates people. It gets in their head. It sticks in their head like the fox and the grapes. PB minus C is like the fox and the grapes. It just happens to piss people off. And I hope it pissed you off a little bit. I hope it got you thinking. I hope it got your blood pumping to your head primarily. Think hard. Know why you vote if you vote. Think about how you live in a, in a fake fable world. So I hope that got you excited about where we're going with expected utility and for the rest of the class. Because it isn't just fake people choosing between fake pop. It's you deciding whether or not to go vote, okay? So what do we talk about today? Well, I mean, there was a bit of a big ending there, right? But we talked primarily about how to encode uncertainty and how to navigate it with the simplest possible statistic in the form of expected value. If you can take an average, which you've done a million times in your life, then you can figure out the raw intuitions that are gonna undergird almost all the calculations that we perform in this class. So yeah, there's arrows and there's blobs and there's dots, but there's also Excel spreadsheets that you've done a thousand times before. You know, uns uncertainty is a foundational aspect of politics and of life. And it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for us to develop a theory that doesn't accommodate that pernicious feature of uncertainty. Political decisions like starting wars or deciding whether or not to go vote or deciding what sort of legislative agenda to set or anything else you can think of, it's pretty rare for something really important to be completely certain. If it's important enough, it's not gonna be certain, right? Because there's gonna be people that are working hard to keep you guessing. Now, that doesn't mean that the old theory, that doesn't mean week two wasn't any good, right? Week two is gonna be the intuition that we build on next week. It's just that suddenly things seem a little bit laughable. The, the first fable, the first rationality fable, which you saw in three flavors, it turns out that that fable is useful for a lot of things like getting you to think about contemplative, consistent, uh, competent decision makers. But it isn't so good for it so far for how to navigate uncertainty by those decision makers. So we need to keep pushing. You know, our frontiers of understanding are continually expanding. That doesn't mean that our old understanding was bad. It just means that it was part of a journey. And likewise, with the first few weeks of this class, we're, we're trying to build up a theory that's going to be able to accommodate games. And it turns out, actually, that the difference between certainty and uncertainty plays a huge role in whether or not game theory is going to be a feasible study for us. You'll see what I mean in a few weeks, but today's lecture actually is a bit of a saving grace. The fact that we can encode and accommodate uncertainty in a relatively simple and straightforward way is gonna be something that is gonna be around us so much for, for in the coming weeks that you won't even notice it. Expected utility calculations are gonna be happening so much that you don't even notice them. Sometimes I'm not even gonna ask you to calculate them. I'll just hand you an expected utility like PB minus C or P minus C and say, hey, just go with this. Expected utility is a nice way for me to communicate with you just directly. And so you're like, well, this is gonna be a really great way for us to study political people. And I'm like, oh no, there's way more to it than that. And it's with that in mind that I'd like to conclude with a provocative thought. Uncertainty is all around us. It's everywhere, whether you like it or not. I know you're young, you're somewhere between 18 and, well, there might be, you're somewhere, but you're early in your journey. And you might be feeling pretty confident about things. Maybe you only applied to one college and you got in and you're like, oh, the world is pretty certain. Uh-uh. So the world is uncertain. And there's reasons for that. And I, I can't pretend to tell you all the reasons. But here are two interesting reasons, as best as I can tell, why uncertainty is all around us and isn't going to go away. The first kind of uncertainty I'd like to talk about is what you might call aleatory uncertainty. 
That's the sort of the uncertainty that's baked into the human enterprise, all right? And a classic example to help introduce the idea is aspirin and headaches. So suppose that you have a headache and you're like, that's not very hard to believe given the last hour of my life. Shut up. So suppose you have a headache and you're thinking about whether or not to take an aspirin. Now, the reason that you take an aspirin is because you think it will reduce the duration of the headache. You would like the headache to go away sooner than later. And so you're thinking about taking an aspirin. Now, if you want to think about the expected utility of taking the aspirin, maybe you have to go to the drugstore and get aspirin. There's cost of get, going to get the aspirin. And the aspirin has some, some tiny cost. So you're thinking, well, how do I know if the aspirin is worth it? So then you start thinking, well, what's the expected duration of my headache conditional on having taken an aspirin? And what's the expected duration of my headache conditional on not taking an aspirin? Now, that's a distribution. Some of the headaches last 10 minutes, some last an hour, some last a minute, some last forever. Right? There's headaches of all sorts of different durations. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to learn everything there is to know about my headaches. And consequently, I'm going to be able to bring all that uncertainty away. I'm going to know exactly how long my headaches last, depending on all sorts of different things. It might be that Rob headaches are longer than regular headaches, or headaches after you had too much fun at the bars last night are different from Rob headaches. So maybe you collect data on which sort of headaches are which. What sort of contextualized headaches are, are which? Maybe it's something where you can tell from, from how you felt going into the headache. Maybe you have a sound sense about where you were prior, like a status quo, and then how the headache was. And you feel very sanguine that if you know all of those things, that you will know exactly how long the headache will last, conditional on all these features. And I call bull I call complete bull on that. The reason that I call bull on that is that nobody in the history of mankind has ever known that. If you knew that, you would be the richest person in the world. You would be the richest person in the world because you would have you aspirin industries and you would know exactly what dosage of aspirin to give to exactly which people conditional on their headaches. You would be so rich. I'm calling complete bullshit on you for thinking that you get to know that. And the reason is sometimes it goes beyond just, oh, I know all about the different features of the headache. Sometimes it's just like, what kind of mood are you in? Like what kind of mood you're in determines your pain threshold, right? If you're really annoyed, as in right now, your headache probably feels a little worse than when you're not annoyed. Or, you know, if, if you didn't sleep a whole lot last night, then your, then your headache in the morning annoys you more. Your pain threshold is different. It could be all sorts of different features out in the world that you never could have hoped to get into your data set. There's all sorts of reasons for a headache to happen that there's no way you could have known about. There's all sorts of volatility out there. You could have headache. You didn't know that I could give you headaches until we got into this class, right? You didn't know that. You didn't have that in your data. There's no, I call bull You don't know that. This aleatory uncertainty is just sort of baked into our human experience. And it isn't just because of all these other features. Some of it's just, we can't measure things perfectly. You know, our, our instruments of measurement, our clocks are not so perfect that we could ever hope to get the time perfect on a, on a headache duration. Likewise with pain threshold detection, no device that you ever designed would be able to measure something so certainly that you have a certain outcome to be thinking about. This kind of uncertainty is something that you hear called aleatory uncertainty, and oftentimes it's referred to as an irreducible nub. You can't get rid of it. However, that's not the only kind of uncertainty I can think of. A second form of uncertainty is something a little bit less out there. It's something that's a little bit more inside ourselves. And it's what you might call strategic uncertainty. And the easiest way for me to talk about strategic uncertainty is to talk about baseball. So I know that you're not all baseball fans, so I'm not gonna expect too much of you. The fable part of baseball is that there's a pitcher and a hitter. And the pitcher wants to throw the ball so that the hitter can't hit it. And the hitter, as you may have guessed from the name, wants to hit the ball, okay? And the pitcher, most pitchers have a bunch of different ways that they can throw a baseball. So, so just to give you an example, right? So, so here's a baseball, which is signed by a cheater who will be remain who will remain nameless. I don't really care if I touch it because it's a cheater. So, you know, I can throw a ball really fast by gripping the ball this way. This is called a forcing fastball. I can just try to throw it as hard as I can. And it just sort of comes straight and then it spins really, really fast and just goes straight. And this is as hard as I can throw it. Some people can throw a ball that way over a hundred miles an hour. Or I could add a third finger to it. All right, and what that means is it sticks to my hand a little bit longer. And so even though the throw looks exactly the same, the pitch ends up going about 10, 12 miles an hour slower just by virtue of being stuck to my hand a little bit more because of this extra finger. So this was a fast one and this was a change up, okay? 
Now, I could also just throw the pitch completely differently. So I could sort of grip it over here. I could grip it over here and then try to throw over the top of it. I could try to throw over the top of it. And what that does is it makes the ball kind of curve like this. It goes slower and it loops. That's called a curve ball. Or I could sort of hold it halfway in between and throw it halfway sideways. And then it goes faster than a curve ball, slower than a fast ball, less straight than a fast ball, but not as curvy as a curve ball. That's called a slider. I could throw, I could grip a pitch like this along the seams with my fingers split. And what happens is then the ball goes fast and sinks. That's called a sinker or a split finger fast. There's all sorts of different pitches that a pitcher can throw. And the hitter doesn't get to know that in advance. Pitchers don't have a habit of saying, okay, here comes a fastball, be ready for it. The hitter would like to know because the hitter would like to know if the ball's gonna move fast, they would just like, if the ball was gonna come at them like this, the hitter would rather say, okay, well, whatever way it looks, I'm gonna go that way and I'm gonna swing real hard because I know the ball isn't gonna move. And if the hitter knew that a curveball was coming, then they would wait. They'd like time it a little bit differently so that the bat and the ball, boom. You have to time it just right. You have to take the path into account. You have to take the slowness into account. You have to take the loopiness into account. And that's going easy on yourself. If I grip the ball like this with just my knuckles, that takes all of the speed, uh, all of the spin off the ball so that it begins to flutter, right? Because what happens is there's randomness in the air and the randomness in the air patterns mixes with these seams. You see these seams? And that randomness makes this ball flutter. It moves real slow and it flutters. So even if the hitter knew a knuckleball was coming, they wouldn't know where to go because the ball, who knows where it's going, okay? So the hitter would like to know, but that doesn't guarantee anything. However, they'd be more set up for success if they knew what the pitch was gonna be. Now the hitter, the pitcher doesn't want the hitter to do well. So pitchers don't throw the same pitch every time. Sometimes they throw fastballs. Sometimes they throw change-ups. Sometimes they throw curveballs. Sometimes they throw sliders. Sometimes they throw splitters. Sometimes they throw knuckleballs. And the hitter doesn't get the know. There's uncertainty in the hitter's life and it's strategic uncertainty. The uncertainty that happens when an opponent wants to keep you guessing. And if you're being honest with yourself, somebody's done that to you once in your life. It could just be nerdy game night, or it could be some true rival out there. I'm mentioning this because uncertainty is just a feature of our lives. We can't get rid of it. We can't ever get rid of it. We have to navigate it. The reason I teach you this isn't just to get you thinking about Theobald von Bethmann Holweg or voters. It's about you. I wanna to talk to you. The world is uncertain and I want you to do well in it. And the way that you do that is by learning how to think hard about these things, learning how to be deliberate about uncertainty, not to avoid it, not to run from it, not to try to escape from it because you can't. There's aleatory uncertainty, there's strategic uncertainty, there's all sorts of uncertainty that I haven't even thought about. There's uncertainty all around you. You're never gonna get away from it. I want you to learn how to navigate it capably rather than try to escape it. And the reason for this week and next is to get you thinking about uncertainty and in particular about risk. How do you make choices when you don't quite know what's going to happen? Because you're never gonna know. You're gonna buy a house and you're not gonna know. You're gonna choose a spouse and you're not gonna know. You're gonna apply to law school and you're not gonna know. But you still have to make choices and you have to be comfortable. You have to be able to sleep at night. And I can tell you from experience that it's hard to sleep at night when you make uncertain choices with any stakes involved. I'm sure you know that too. It's not just about this stupidity, although a lot of people stay up at night about how to hit a baseball. Fables go beyond succinct representations of things. One great thing about a fable is it's a laboratory. You can think about what a protagonist should have done in that situation and envision yourself in that very same situation. That uncertainty that a given decision maker has in an abstract world is uncertainty that you can imagine for yourself. The protagonists of our fables are supposed to be you. If you can think about fables, not just as ways to convey meaning, but also as laboratories for how to think in hard, sticky situations, then you're gonna get more out of this class than just how to decide whether or not to go to war, which chances are good you'll never have to do. So pick your house well. Pick your spouse well. I did. Pick your dog well. Pick your stocks well. Pick well. Be deliberate. And you'll be able to sleep at night. Now, you might not be able to sleep at night this week because you'll be working so hard on your problem set. I'm looking forward to thinking about that with you. But in the meantime, thanks for watching.